You ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our second invited speaker for Popple, Brigitte Pienka. Brigitte is a professor at McGill University where she leads the computation and logic group. Um, I've known Brigitte for a long time. Uh, she was a visiting scientist at Cornell when I just started my PhD program. That's right. That's a long time ago. It was a long time ago. <laughs> but um, I have always admired Brigitte's work. She is one of the top researchers in understanding how do we develop systems and languages to support variable binding, which I understand is a very difficult problem. Um, she's done a lot of fantastic work over the years, especially the work on contextual actual modal type theory, um, the development of the Beluga language, um, her work on co-patterns I particularly like. Um, PPDP recently recognized her paper from 10 years ago, so this was in 2008, they gave her, or they, in 2018, they gave her the 2008 award for their test of time for her work. Um, and um, at the same time, She's such a delightful speaker. She's so clear, yet so lyrical and poetic. Oh, I <laughs> Sorry have, to pressure. I, I have a lot of to live up here. <laughs> <laughs> so I am I'm absolutely delighted that she's here. She's such an asset to our community, and I'm very much looking forward to her talk. Oh, thank you very much, Stephanie, for this introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you for, for coming, and thank you for the organizers uh, to invite me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and talk about something I have been thinking about for a long time. I've had discussion with some of you in the audience for uh, quite some time, and it's, it's a delight to see it is also uh, a topic the community has embraced, especially in the last um, 10, 15 years, and it is about mechanizing meta theory. So I want to start by sort of, uh, sort of that we're all on the same page. What is actually mechanized meta theory? Okay. And so one of the aspects we as core uh, in programming languages, what we do as researchers is really we work with theories. Okay. So we, we think about uh, defining an operational semantics. We define various kinds of type systems. We might define a type inference algorithm. We work maybe with a type theory itself. Um, we define program transformations. Uh, we think about a lot, various kinds of logics, reason about programs, and all these theories, they're often defined via axioms and inference rules. But of course, we're not just defining theories, right? We also want to make sure that these theories actually make sense. And for that reason, we're usually interested in, in the meta theory. So the theorems or properties the theories themselves have. And so we might study type safety or preservation and progress. But we might be interested in also deeper properties, such as contextual equivalence, consistency, normalization, and, and so on. Now, uh, most of the time, we do this on paper, right? Uh, and these appendices we sometimes have uh, in, as a companion to our Popple paper. They can be easily be 20, 40, uh, 60, 80. Yesterday, I was at a talk by Neil Krishnaswamy, and he said his appendix was 160 pages, OK? Handwritten proofs. They can be really, really substantial. And so when you do the whole thing in a proof assistant, that's what we mean by mechanized meta theory. Right? And in some way, there's a lot of hope that uh, keeping sort of the theory in balance with its meta theory, a proof assistant could ease that task and could help us sort of to keep that balance uh, in check because it's really a delicate balance, right? Uh, if you tweak something in your theory, you might break one of your, your lemmas and theorems in your meta theory, and it's really a process that goes back and forth. So let me ask you here, uh, who has used a proof assistant in various forms, either just to dabble and experience and experiment? Right, so that's totally amazing to me, uh, and I'm, I'm really delighted to, to see. So I want to sort of reflect with you a little bit on why, right, is it interesting for us to explore um, proof assistance even if we don't end up fully mechanizing our work? And what are sometimes these challenges we run into? And, and where are we going uh, so with, with, this, uh, with this work? So, uh, well, the first uh, thing, as you already noticed, right, lots of you raised their hands. And uh, clearly, you know, you, if you go outside and have conversations with people, you will notice that people talk a lot about using COC and ACTA and Isabel and and various other systems. So it's really people something, everybody talks about it in some way. Okay. 
and it is also visible in the community. I think it really started thanks to the work by Stephanie and Benjamin Pierce and Steve Sedankovic and Peter Sewell when it started sort of to become a very, uh, with the popular Poplar Mark Challenge, got a lot of attention in the programming language community. And it was a small enough challenge problem that you could do it within a day or two. You could read up about it in the, in the book, uh, Types in Programming Languages, if you didn't know how to solve this problem, which was about mechanizing system F sub. Um, and it was really a way of exploring the design space and methodologies people employ when they want to mechanize a formal system. And following from that, there were definitely a lot of uh, Cox summer schools, Cox uh, Deep Spec summer school, there was a Cox boot camp, there was an ACTA tutorial here at Popple. We see uh, the Software Foundation series, which really, uh, really does a, a, a valuable service to the educational community of spreading the gospel of using Cox in, in mechanizing meta theory. We've seen recently a post by Phil Wadler advertising his course notes on using ACTA for doing something similar as the uh, Software Foundations. Um, and we've seen even a book like The Little Typer in the series, like Little ML or Little, Little Schemer. Um, and uh, recently, over the last year when I was on sabbatical, uh, together with uh, other developers of programming environments, in particular Andreas Abel, who works on ACTA, Guillaume Allais, who has built a library for ACTA, uh, Stephen Schaefer and Katrin Stark, who are both coming from the COC community, and others, we, we've kind of thought of what would be a good challenge problem to follow up on the Poplar Mark Challenge. And if there is some time, I'll, I'll, I'll also follow, uh, share some of these ideas here. So everybody seems to be talking about it. And I think to some extent why it's been so successful is because it's such an easy step. If you've implemented your compiler in ML, or if you implemented a type checker in ML or a Camel, uh, you know, or in Haskell, uh, then in some way you can use these definitions you've written uh, almost out of the box and you can use them in ACTA and, or COC and, and they seem to work. Okay, so it's very tempting to cross over this bridge which uh, might be a bit more precarious than it actually seems and uh, you end up on the other side uh, and, um, and there if you start proving things, it, things might not be so easy. So, uh, but then we have you, okay, and then you're, you're, and there's been also a lot of cross-fertilization, I think, between the dependent types community on one side and the simple types community on the other. But there are some more tangible benefits, of course, why we care about mechanizing systems. It's not just intellectually stimulating, right? It's, it's really because it establishes trust in the systems we work with, and it, it helps to avoid flaws. And I want to give you two more examples, which are more, more concrete why, why it's really important to think about mechanizing uh, systems. And the first one is because we know programs go wrong. And um, so uh, back in the 1970s, one of the big challenges proposed by Tony Hoare was to have a verified compiler. And luckily, right, Xavier Leroy built a verified compiler within COC in 2009. And so that was a huge milestone for our community. And um, if, you, if you see, you know, there are lots of work still on testing C compilers. And there's some nice work by uh, researchers from UC Davis who built a testing framework. And they tried to break, in some sense, concert and compared how good their tool was on the implementations of the C compiler in GCC and LLVM. And, and they found over 195 bugs in GCC and LLVM, which sounds great. Okay. Um, but really, concert was uh, the system they weren't able to break. And they say themselves, you know, this is a strong testimony to the premise and quality of verified compilers. And we've seen definitely a lot of talks in that area as well. And the second example I want to mention is, well, programming language designs can go wrong. And, um, you know, if you go back 20 years ago, the researchers uh, in this community were quite excited because for the first time, you know, uh, Java came out and for the first time it had a formal language specification we could study and it had this claim that Java was type safe. Okay. And so uh, essentially a well type program would not go wrong. And so academic researchers like Sophia Drosopolo and Susan Eisenbach looked at it and said, okay, is this claim true? And they wrote this uh, paper with this wonderful title, uh, Java is type safe, probably. Okay. And then in the same year, there was a note by Vijay Sarsvad on his webpage and saying, no, Java is not type safe. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and then there, it spawned a lot of work uh, we, on Feather by Java and mechanizing properties about Java. Okay. And you might think, okay, for sure we figured this thing out. Um, but in 2016, there was a paper, for example, by Nada Amin and, and uh, Ross Tate 
saying you know Java and Scala type systems are unsound, and that uh, followed was followed by a paper uh, proposing the dot calculus as a foundation for uh, reasoning about Scala and and part of part of Scala and part of Java, and that was then the type standards proof was implemented, for example, in Coq, and there's not only one implementation of it in Coq, there's at least two I know of. Okay. So um, so you might say, okay, so why why is it so hard, right, to get these theories and implementations right? Um, and, uh, you know, I really like uh, John Reynolds' quote where he was saying, uh, the truth of the matter is that putting languages together is a very tricky business. When one attempts to combine language concepts, unexpected and counterintuitive interactions arise. And in the end, you know, all that sort of helps you is really to do a proper proof. Um, and so, um, you know, we should write proofs, but correct proofs are also tricky to write. Um, on paper, um, it's challenging to keep track of all these details, right? Because there is a very delicate balance to keep everything in harmony um, between your theory you're working with and your meta theory you're trying to establish. Uh, it's easy to skip over details, right? I mean, who cares? Uh, you know, we, we know what variable bindings are and how substitution is. These are concepts we teach the undergraduates, but like once we, we, we work with our own theories, we just take them for granted. Um, so these, these di it's, it's difficult to understand how these different kind of features interact. And these difficulties increase with size, not only with the size of the language, I think, but also with the property you're aiming to prove. Okay. So in a proof assistant, things in principle should be maybe easier, okay? because, um, well, clearly, right, if you, if, you're, if you change something in your theory, you, know, you should flag an error that this lemma doesn't go through anymore. Okay, so there's a lot of hope that yes, proof assistance should make our life easier. Um, but on the other hand, there is quite a lot of overhead and infrastructure you might need to build up uh, in order to get something off the ground. And that means also you might get lost in some of the technical low-level details. Uh, it can be quite time-consuming. And I think one aspect that often is sort of forgotten is that experience really, really matters. So, um, you know, I want to share with you a quote, of, and this is by Ezra Cooper when he was a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh about 10 years ago, and he was inspired to use Coq to prove the normalization, uh, normalization of simply type lambda calculus, and he looked essentially at uh, this book, Proofs and, Ty uh, Proofs and Types by Girard, some of you might know, it's a little book, um, and it is, uh, you know, four pages. It describes how to do this kind of proof. It's a logical relations proof, so it seems kind of like something one, one should be able to do. And he chose Coq, and he chose an encoding called De Bruyne, where you model variables with, with numbering. And so I think this experience he had is actually quite, uh, quite common if you start doing this kind of work. And so let me just read it to you. Okay. To those that doubted De Bruyne, I wish to prove them wrong or discover why they were right. Now, after some years and many hundred hours of labor, I can say with some authority, they were right. The Brun indices are foolishly difficult for this kind of proof. The full proof runs 3,500 lines, although that relies on a further library of 1,900 lines of basic facts about lists and sets. Um, the cost of the Brun was partly reflected in the painful 1,600 lines that are used to prove facts about shifting and substitution. So this is the simply type lambda calculus, okay? I'm not talking about Rust or Java here, okay? But it's an interesting property. It's certainly more interesting than type preservation and progress. So the question I'm interested in is really, what are good high-level proof languages, okay, to make it easier to mechanize meta theory and have the right abstractions in, in the systems we work with? And I think this is a question that, of course, should also be of interest in the programming language community because the key is, is abstraction. And uh, so uh, an abstraction is, is a valuable aspect when we develop high-level programming languages. So this is a quote by Barbara Lishkov going back to her work on data abstraction where she sort of says the motivation behind her work in very high-level languages is to ease the programming task by providing the programmer with a language containing primitives or abstractions suitable to their problem area. The programmer is then able to spend their effort in the right place. They concentrate on solving their problem, and the resulting program will be more reliable as a result. Clearly, this is a worthwhile goal. So I think we should really think about what are good abstractions in order to make our life ultimately easier. Okay. 
so um so it sometimes is good to know ah the past in order to know where we're going okay so so let me take you back to the eighty s the eighty s were great who was born after the eighty s who's here it's worthwhile go back to the eighty s the music was great everything comes back okay so the eighty s yes so in the eighty s actually there were a number of interesting papers in particular there was the first paper on the calculus of construction Thierry Concon finished his PhD thesis it became the foundation of Koch uh, there were a number of papers on Martin Luther type theory, okay, which became the foundation of ACTA. Okay. Um, and, and these systems were really kind of conceived as systems as a found, uh, to, uh, building a foundation for mechanizing mathematics. Okay. But there was also uh, another really interesting paper um, that uh, tried to be a little less ambitious, but a little bit more concentrated effort on, on logics and formal systems. And that was a paper by Bob Harper, who's here, Furio Hansel and Gordon Plotkin, and the paper was a framework for defining logics, and it was presented at Lix in 87. And it's commonly known today as the logical framework, LF. And it has a beautiful idea, namely to use a dependently typed lambda calculus, so it doesn't have very much in it, okay, it has just applications and abstractions in it, and you can define constants, and use that as a meta language for representing formal systems. And what it, uh, what it laid the basis is what an encoding technique that many of you might know, which is called higher order abstract syntax. And maybe that's a misnomer to some extent, uh, because what we're, we're, yes, we're building syntax trees and syntax definitions and abstract syntax trees that have functions in them, but these functions are very weak functions, and I call them here intentional functions. And Dale Miller would probably call this a lambda tree syntax, okay? And indeed, we often call this higher order abstract syntax, uh, and there was a paper in 1988 by Frank Fenning and Connell Elliott that had the same, same title. So let me tell you a little bit what, what it is, okay, uh, if you don't know about it, and at least my, my take on it, okay? So the first step you need to do is you need to implement whatever object language you work with in your theory, and so here's the favorite canonical example, which is a simply typed lambda calculus. So on the left side, you see we define types like natural numbers and function spaces. And on the right side, we define our little term language, which has variables in it, lambda, lambdas, which are functions, where uh, variables x is annotated with its type, and m is the body, and then we have applications. So how do you implement this in a, in a programming language or proof assistant? Well, you need two types, okay? One for the types of your language and one for the terms. And so in LF, we introduce two types, one I call obj for objects, okay, and then it has two constants, nat and arrow, and nat is just saying I'm an object, and arrow takes in two objects and produces an object. And terms uh, has also two constants, uh, app, which takes in two terms and returns an app, and lam takes in first the type a, so then object, that's the type we pass, okay, and then we have a function, which is here in orange, which goes from term to term, to model the fact that this lamb we have in our language takes in a variable x and it binds any variable in the body m. Okay. So uh, here are a bunch of examples. Okay. So you can use, um, if you have the identity function, you know, this is just translated directly, lamb turns into this lamb, different font, nat is the annotation, and then we have lambda x, x, which describes that you have an identity function, x is bound by the lambda x. Okay. So now you see that that these, why Dale Miller calls it lambda tree syntax, because you have these lambda functions which bind variables. Okay. Now the second example, uh, basically we ha it's a notion of overshadowing. You have the orange lambda, which says I'm, a, I'm an ax, which is of type nat, and then you have a blue lambda introduced, a blue, a blue ax introduced, which says ax is of a function from nat to nat, and you return the innermost. Okay. So there's a notion of overshadowing, but uh, nothing to worry, okay, because our meta language knows what it means to overshadow. Both binders are mapped to real Greek lambdas in our meta language. Okay. And the last example just says, you know, I have an X which I introduce, and I have an F that I introduce, and then I want to apply app FX, and that's just literally translated in the same way. I introduce a lambda for X and a Greek lambda also for F. Okay. So the point is that you uniformly model bindings, okay, via these lambda functions, the Greek lambda functions, okay. 
and that means you inherit from the from the language, from the meta language, essentially alpha renaming and single substitutions, because of course we know how to deal with these Greek lambdas. Okay. So it's really uniform. I want to emphasize that. Okay, this has nothing to do that I chose the simply type lambda calculus. Okay. Um, if I want to introduce polymorphism into my language for all alpha a, or I want to add in some let expressions, I want to in introduce abstractions over type variables, it's the same principle. Okay. We introduce a constant all. Well, what does it bind? Well, it binds objects. Okay, so it should have a function from object to object. Okay, uh, what about abstractions over type variables in my term language? Well, I'm abstracting over type variables, so it'd be a function from object to term. What about let? Okay, well, let has two arguments. One takes in a term, m, and then x binds any occurrence in n, so that's the second argument, and it should be a function because I'm binding terms. So it's really, really uniform in the way we use it. And then you see again here in the last, uh, at the bottom of the slide, you know, if you say, for example, for all alpha, for all beta, alpha, arrow, beta, you know, the alpha is mapped for all alpha. The binding is mapped to the lambda function in LF. So I want to emphasize, okay, that, uh, okay, hopefully I emphasize that enough, okay. LF functions encode variable scope. That's all they do. Okay. There's no recursion. There is no pattern matching. There are no if statements. Okay. This is all they do. It's really a syntax tree with binders. Okay, that's what it is. It's like nothing more. Um, and these syntax trees are then, you know, modulo alpha renaming, and you can instantiate the variables via substitution principles. And that scales to model also derivation trees where you have to have a notion of scope, for example, when you have hypothetical or parametric derivations. So you might say, okay, uh, sounds maybe cool. Uh, can I do this in OCaml or ACTA? And well, you could try, okay, so <laughs> it's worth a try. Uh, so you're like, okay, uh, what do I need to do? Well, I need to apparently define some kind of uh, data type for terms, and here I gave it just one uh, constructor, LAM, okay? And uh, it takes in an argument. Okay, and it's supposed to take in a function as an argument. Okay, so term, arrow, term. And then I define an actual function, apply. Okay, so I, uh, it's a function that pattern matches on the input. So it's a function which takes in the TM, a term. Okay, it will uh, look at the pattern lam f, and it returns f. It strips off the lam. And so it's a function that returns a function, term, arrow, term. And then I have uh, defined a constant, omega which just builds one of these TM objects. So, any OCaml programmers here? Daring, okay. So what happens when we try to evaluate apply omega omega? It will loop, okay. So if you're an OCaml programmer, you're like, okay, I write, you know, obviously we can write looping programs um, too bad, okay. Maybe it's surprising to some of you that you can write a looping program without having a recursive function, but yes, you can. Um, now, the problem is not uh, in, uh, the problem is obviously not, not OCaml, the problem is if you do the same thing in, in a system like ACTA or COG, you, can, you could in principle write the same kind of program and you would write have a non-terminating function, which would mean that your system is inconsistent, okay. And so what these systems do, they prevent you from doing a definition like that. Um, so that violates what is known the positivity restriction, okay, where you can't have essentially a negative occurrence or a function that takes the thing you're trying to define as an input. And it goes back to the fact that in OCaml and ACTA, these functions are really black boxes. That's what we're used to. Okay? They, um, we can observe the result of what the function computes. Okay? But certainly, you cannot pattern match on the body of a function in OCaml or ML. Okay? Uh, that's what my undergraduates try to do when I give them a church encoding, but that's not something you can do. Okay? So, okay, so you're like, okay. But really, we do want to write recursive programs about over these higher <laughs> sex index trees. What, what are they useful for otherwise? Okay? Um, and so what's the problem? Well, so the problem is obviously that if I write a little function like size, which just counts the constructors, uh, right, uh, then I make a recursive call. Here is my favorite term. I left out the type annotations to make it a little bit easier to read. I make a recursive call on the body, and the x becomes free. Okay, and then I make another recursive call, and the f becomes free. 
And so now I have these three variables and I don't know what their size would be. Okay. Um, and that led into the, in the 90s to a lot of activities and a lot of questions on how we can reason about these higher up subsyntax signatures. And uh, Andy Pitts and Jamie Gabay in their work on nominal logic said, you know, the whole high out of sex syntax approach by its very nature disallows the feature that we regard of key practical importance, the ability to manipulate names of bound variables explicitly in computations and proofs. And indeed, you know, you might have thought, oh, okay, where are these variables? I didn't see them. Okay. And they're not there. Okay. So it took some time uh, to actually understand how we should go about doing this. Okay. Um, and, oops, oh my, what's happening? <laughs> my, my laptop just froze. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, let me see if I can restart my slides at least. Sorry. Oops. Ah, okay, that works, of course. Yeah. So it took some time to, um, to think about, right, what, what should happen. Um, and so it took almost 20 years uh, until we, we sort of had uh, some, some idea what should maybe happen. And the idea is, that we should really look at these LF syntax trees uh, maybe a little bit more closer because what happens when you do pattern matching is you want to extract what is in this box. Okay? But obviously what is in this box depends on, on X. Okay? So, I, so how do we type what is in the box? Okay? Well, um, as in any typing judgment, you have a context of assumptions, a term, and a type. And uh, so if you want to type the thing which is in the box, you say, well, it has an X, which is a term, and then I have the term lam, lambda F app FX, which is your LF term, and it has a type, namely it's a TM. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Okay, but I still wanna know what's in the box, okay? So what if I pattern match on this thing and I still have a box, what is the type of this box, okay? And here, the key insight is that you can essentially internalize the type LF typing judgment as an actual type. And that is what we call a contextual type. Okay. So the type which is in this inner box here, okay, that's a type, uh, an object that has type TM, but it can depend on X and on F. Okay. And this box here, the type is a TM, but it can refer to a variable X. Okay. So now you have a way of actually expressing open terms. Okay terms or derivations or objects in general that can depend on, on variables. So uh, now if you want to name these holes, then you have a context, okay, where you keep track of them. So here I call it H, okay? Uh, so H is what I call a contextual variable. It has a contextual type, can be instantiated with a contextual term, namely app FX that depends on X and F. And really these, these, these contextual types reify our typing judgment, right? They give us a way to talk about a well-typed term. Okay, so uh, you're hopefully with me, although it's Friday morning. Um, so you're like, okay, but wait, okay. Whatever we plug in may contain these three variables, but um, you know, who guarantees that I chose X and F? And indeed, everything should be stable under alpha renaming. So if I choose here app GY, and I say this is a term that depends on Y and G, can I still use it here where I have X and F? Okay, and uh, that's a very legitimate question to ask and it's a question that also arises when you do template or macros in, in languages. And the answer to that is that we should associate these kinds of contextual variables with a substitution and in this case it's just doing a simple renaming, renaming these green variables to the variables we actually have here in our local context. Okay, so, um, so that means you, you get uh, two kinds of variable rules. One is the one you know and love from your simply typed lambda calculus or your dependently typed lambda calculus or whatever your favorite language is. Whenever you have an X, okay, you wanna know what it's type, you look it up in your local context, psi, and you say, oh, X has type A, so therefore X has type A. 
Now, the second rule is for uh, contextual variables or holes. So they come from gamma. And they, ha they, they have a type A in a context phi. So now you need to justify why you can use something in a context psi. And so you have a transition from phi to psi, which is witnessed by a substitution sigma. So it's like a morphism, if you like. Okay. And so this, we now have a closure. And here we apply the substitution because you have a dependently typed uh, theory. So A can depend on phi. And you need to move phi to the context you're currently living in. OK, so, uh, so this uh, led to essentially Beluga. Okay? Uh, it allowed us to define things like the lambda calculus or other theories in a logical framework. And we would then package up our, uh, our derivation trees as a contextual object above the water. Okay? And we add them here essentially as base types to the language. So the language is pretty much like a OCaml or ML, if you like. Okay, or, or from a proof theory point of view, it's like a first order logic. And instead of reasoning about lists and binary trees, you reason about these guys. Okay, these guys, okay, which are defined essentially here, and they capture sort of a lot of things of the infrastructure um, that you usually define by by yourself. But we bake it into the equational theory of these objects. Okay, so. Um, so that allows us to actually reason about um, formal systems. So um, it not only so if you look at the size program, what it happens is you look at your term in an empty context, you make a recursive call, you move x to your local context, you pop, you start populating your context. Okay, it's added f, and then you look at f and x both within the context they actually live in. And that means, in the end, you know, the program, uh, you, one thing you need in addition is you need to be able to abstract over your context because it actually grows. So uh, here I wrote the program in an equational style. And essentially what you need to do is you uh, say for all contexts, gamma, if you give me a term in gamma, I'm going to return an integer. And I, let me start with the last case, which is the most obvious. If you have an application M and N in gamma, you make a recursive call. If, it's, uh, if it sits under a lambda, you make a recursive call in an extended context. And then we have a special pattern variable, which captures the case, indeed, that uh, this will only succeed when it, when it uh, can be instantiated with a variable from gamma. And we use higher order pattern matching, which is a, it's a fragment of, of higher order matching, which is actually decidable. Okay. So now. We, we can do all kinds of things, things that were uh, really out of reach and thought to be very difficult with high-order abstract syntax. For example, we can write a type-preserving closure conversion and hoisting algorithm. Okay, uh, we can do various kinds of inductive proofs, in particular inductive proofs about logical relations. We can do co-inductive proofs using co-patterns and implementing proofs about bias stimulation. But I want to focus a little bit on these inductive proofs. Okay. So in particular, uh, you, know, you remember that I told you about Ezra Cooper at the beginning, who, uh, who was set out on this quest to do the strong normalization proof in Koch. And it was really hard. Okay? And we thought it would be interesting to revisit you know, and compare what's, how far we progressed. And so uh, indeed, you know, logical relation proofs were mentioned in the original Poplemark challenge as an extension of one should maybe consider. And so over the last year or two, I had various conversations with other developers. And I think that's one of the differences between who was involved in formulating the challenge compared to the first one. We were all developers working on our own systems. Okay? And we wanted to have a problem that was fairly easily accessible, but still worthwhile. It would survey the state of the art of how we do these kind of normalization proofs, as well as what we do in, in mechanizing them. Uh, we wanted to really compare and understand uh, what, what every system was in some way sense doing, and we wanted to make these systems more robust. Okay? That was a really important aspect. And I'm happy to, to talk more about uh, these different, um, different mechanizations. There was one essentially in, in ACTA using uh, a library uh, by Guillaume Allais based on uh, category theory, <clears throat> and there was uh, an approach uh, by Stephen Schaefer and Catherine Stark on, in Koch. Uh, I will follow, um, fo focus mostly uh, right now on some of the lessons I took away from, but if you're interested, you can certainly read this paper. So the first lesson, I think, is that it matters what kind of proof you're trying to mechanize. Okay? 
and so in particular one of the things we learned was that if you choose an inductive definition for strong normalization proofs become much more modular and simpler and that was an idea by Femke von Ramstong and Paula Severi shared in the mid 90s okay and it was picked up by Ralph Mattis and this this modularity pays off not only on paper but especially if you do it in a in a proof assistant now the second lesson was that it was reassuring to realize that yes the abstractions we we picked in Beluga, they really paid off, okay? It has led to a very compact implementation and we were able to use our first class context substitutions and renaming. And the third lesson I think was what came out was that contextual types provide an abstract and conceptual view of syntax trees with the context of assumptions. And they are closely related to well-scoped or intrinsically typed De Bruyne encodings, but they intrinsically typed De Bruyne encodings capture only one part of what contextual types really do. And for that particular challenge problem, that was enough, okay? And it really inspired, for example, Catherine and Steven to, uh, they had a paper at CPP where they built an auto subs library too, which now is able to generate, for example, from a given higher abstract syntax signature, you know, a fragment of what we would normally write in LF, it would generate for you uh, an intrinsically typed uh, De Bruyne encoding. So, um, so you might say, okay, um, sounds cool, but, how can we get this really in a type theory? I want to do ACTA or COC, right? I don't, I don't want to learn another system. And so uh, you're right, okay, we, we should think about that. Okay. And so what's the problem of this? Okay, so the problem is that, uh, is this rule, okay, I showed you earlier. It's where that we, when we build syntax trees, you can only refer to holes, okay? But you cannot embed arbitrary computations. And that enforces a very strict segregation, which was very visible in this idea that you have this iceberg above the water is your proof and below the water is, is, is your definitions. Okay. And so, so for the last 10 years, uh, people kind of asked me, right? I had postdocs asking me, so why? Okay, and then I had PhD students asking me, why? And then I went to conference and I go, why? Uh, and, and so that was every time, it was me when somebody asked me this, okay, that, that I was somewhat terrified uh, uh, to, to think about it. But what, what it actually would, would happen is that, well, you would have here, a term, a computation, okay, which you're doing sort of unquoting, okay, because the other thing was quoting, so now you're doing unquote, okay, and the computation promises the same thing as the whole promise, it, it just promises really to compute that whole, okay. Um, so, okay, what if? Um, so, so it took a while for me to get around to this, okay? Uh, in particular, it helps if you have a sabbatical and you have some time to think about these things. And so uh, over the last year, I was at LMU and I had uh, many, many discussions also with uh, Andrea Zabel and uh, my two PhD students can take credit for chipping away at me that I actually think about this more. And we, we developed a, a, a type theory, a Martin Loaf type theory that would have a hierarchy of universes. It would have type level computations. You can write proofs about the function like size I showed you, okay? And it does allow to embed also computations in types. So we still separate the syntax on the side, okay? And you, you embed syntax data, data structures, if you like, or syntax trees inside computations over here via a box or a quote. You can do pattern matching on the side, you can do recursion, okay? But you can also do an unquote over here and that's the orange error that, that, was, that was so far missing. Okay. And so going through this proof was really a, quite a substantial, substantial work. But it works out, okay, that's a good line. So, you know, so why, uh, what is a, maybe an interesting um, um, example to look at? And, um, that's, for example, the translation from simply type lambda calculus to Cartesian closed categories. So that is an example I, which bothered me for a long time because it, I already looked at it when I was a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon and there was this note by Andre Filinski, some of you might know, uh, who had attempted this in the proof assistant ELF, which was the first proof assistant that implemented LF. And essentially the idea is you have a simply typed term, here's a type family, which I introduced, uh, which I index with objects, so this will be only about type terms and I want to write an interpretation of these terms as morphisms between two objects. And so the first thing you, you will notice is that you will need, in this interpretation function, you will work with open terms because they're well-typed and they live in a particular context, okay? 
And so the first thing you, you need to understand is how you translate your, your context into a type. And the relationship is essentially if you have a bunch of declarations, it turns into a cross product. Okay, so that's a function we can already write in Beluga. But the last, uh, this function here is more difficult. It would say that if you have a term of type A in a context gamma, I'm going to return to you a morphism from the translation of gamma. Okay, so you're computing the type gamma would be corresponding to 2A. And so you're embedding a computation inside. Okay. And ultimately, you even want to write a program that would say, if two terms are equivalent over here and you translate them, they remain equivalent. Okay? That's another program above the program you actually, this interpretation function. So that's what, what it will, will open up with. <clears throat> so the, the goal is really to bridge the gap that sort of uh, existed as really since the 80s. Okay? So we, we have a left on one side, and it's, it's, you can li live happily in a left, uh, and you can live happily uh, in a Martin Löw type theory, um, but really we would like to sort of get these worlds closer together. Okay, and so um, we, we've, I think we succeeded in a, in a significant step towards that direction, but there's, there's really more to do. So, um, now as I mentioned, we proved consistency using a logical relations argument, a Kripke style logical relations argument based on some of the development uh, that was done prior in, uh, for type theories. But we also need to prove decidable equality. Okay, I'm not too worried about that. It should be decidable. It would be nice to have a categorical semantics for contextual types, okay, to understand them better. And I think there's lots more room of exploring relationships, uh, for example, to CRISP type theory. Um, but ultimately, I think theory can't live in isolation, okay? It really needs to live together with implementation so we can actually learn uh, and use, use these kind of uh, systems to do case studies. Okay. So in the next uh, line, we should really try to build an extension for Koch or Acta or Beluga um, and explore various kinds of case studies like the equivalence between simply type lambda calculus and Cartesian closed categories. Now, I think it also opens up an uh, interesting uh, perspective to metaprogramming. So, uh, because of the fact that box is related to quote and unbox is related to unquote, uh, it really kind of has the potential to be a foundation for metaprogramming. Okay? And so that's been a real sort of open question. Many you know, systems try to support it. There's template cock. There's a you know, sort of quote and unquote in Idris. There's also some, some form of metaprogramming in ACTA. Um, but I think what we don't understand very well is what is a good foundation for these things, right? And that would allow us to write tactics within the system itself. Compilation is an important and interesting aspect as well. You know, I think because um, if you can sort of, what is the, we should really think of abstractions and then how we can compile them. And contextual types is one way to think about an abstraction. And then you think of the lower level part is for example, well-typed uh, De Bruyne indices, right? But you don't have to work with well-typed De Bruyne indices. I passionately hate De, De Bruyne indices, although I use them in my implementation, okay? But I definitely passionately help them, hate them. I had too many bugs related to them. And last, I want to mention proof search. So this is really something I wanted to do for, you know, originally, and then I got sidetracked in trying to figure out what's the logic I want to do proof search in. And, uh, and that turned uh, to be the foundation of Beluga. But I think it is really, really important that we develop proof search tools. And in order to develop proof search tools, we need good logical foundations. Okay. So, um, well, what are some of the lessons? Okay, where, where, where should we go? Okay. So I think one lesson I hope uh, you, you feel inspired to is to look at contextual types. Uh, you know, there was a talk also yesterday which used this idea in uh, the live programming environment, Hazel, and I think it has a lot to offer as, as a way of thinking about holes in terms or syntax trees within a con context of assumptions. So it, it has a very broader application than, than maybe what I just showed you, but it gives a very con conceptual framework really of also developing your proofs. Okay? And the second uh, thing I would like to uh, really emphasize is Abstractions are useful. Okay? If you have an abstractions for valuable binding, context and substitutions, they, they can be valuable. Okay? Um, you, you, you don't have to live through the pain of Ezra Cooper. Okay? 
Um, now, at the same time, I want to say, you know, um, there are many more abstractions, of course, right? So if you work on a low-level memory model uh, where you're like, oh, I don't have really, binding isn't really my problem. My problem is that I work with heaps, okay, and I have an equational theory about heaps. Well, maybe that is something which should be, we should be thinking about abstracting over, okay? Um, maybe linearity. If you work on session types, right, then you have a linear system, and you're like, well, you know, linearity, I don't know, even know where to begin, maybe how to use a system like Cock to mechanize these systems. And that's true, right? Linearity opens many, many more challenges and, and, and we, we should investigate and we have indeed looked, for example, at linear contextual type theory, okay, as one way to thinking about it, okay? Resources is another avenue, you know, you might wanna want to consider. So I'm not claiming that this is the only abstraction but variable binding and context and substitutions, but it is one we, we have talked about for 30 years and I think we're now getting to a point where we really understand it. And I think we should have benchmarks that uh, when somebody proposes a new approach, right, uh, of saying here is a new library, here's a new system, that we can sort of say understand it and understand how to put it in relationship to other existing systems and make them also more robust in the end. Okay. So thank you. Uh, that's all I have to say and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Um, so we have some questions coming in from Slido, and if you, or if you would rather to ask your question in person, raise your hand and we'll have a student volunteer come around with the microphone. But I'll start with a Slido question. Okay. So, um, so the first question is, does your approach work with process calculi, where one often has to compute under binders such as name restrictions? So indeed, uh, process calculi, uh, so Dale Miller, for example, has as an example implemented the PyCalculus. So in that sense, you know, I think that there, uh, um, that can be done. But uh, if you have certainly more unusual binding structures, you know, then, then uh, this, this will not work. I mean, this is a very domain-specific approach uh, which focuses on a very particular approach of binding, which is very common, but it doesn't capture all. Okay, okay so I think Phil has a Question next. That was, a oh, that was a lovely talk, thank you. Thank you for mentioning Ezra Miller, my old student. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to rehabilitate De Bruyne indices a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I did things with ordinary variable names and with De Bruyne indices uh, in my textbook. And then for De Bruyne indices, I moved to using what's called intrinsic typing where the terms are indexed by types, which was known to some as a good idea and turns out to be a really good idea. The absolutely. code was much smaller by about a, um, absolutely close to half the size, actually the golden ratio. That's right. Um, and if you do it intrinsically, you're much less likely to make mistakes with the indices. And I think also things have come on. So like there's a very nice way of writing out substitution uh, due to Conor McBride and James McKenna, and that made my life so much easier. Yes. So one of the interesting things in this area, I think, is every now and then somebody comes across a new way of thinking about things, which yes. makes it so much easier. Yes. I, I mean, I completely uh, agree uh, that, I, and I think, you know, as I mentioned, contextual types are more like an abstract way and a more general way of looking at this issue. Intrinsically typed Debrun encodings can be very valuable. I mean, as you say, right? And we use them, for example, in this problem mark reloaded challenge. Um, you know, they are used both in, uh, they're used, for example, in a Cox solution, okay? Now, I also want to say that it's not so obvious how they would scale, okay? That if you have, for example, intersection types or if you have dependent types or uh, more fancy type systems, okay? Yeah, so they hit a very particular sweet spot. It's really hard. <laughs> right, so, so they hit a particular sweet spot, okay? Yeah. But if you, if you take an approach like contextual type theory, we are not, or LF, right? We're not restricted to that. And that I think is important to understand that you know what's you know that they work and, they, and that's great that they work, but like how far can one go with it and how you know to systems which aim to be sort of more general in a foundational way. Right. So anyhow, rather people shouldn't think of the 1,900 lines that uh, Ezra mentioned. I did not prove termination, but just to give do progress and preservation for PCF is 275 lines. Right. But I mean, doing normalization is significantly more complicated. But I can also say there's no hope. It's not, uh, you know, not all is lost. Uh, so uh, 
i think there's let me just mention two things about this. one is that ezra chose accessibility relation. he didn't choose a a normal ah an inductive definition, which makes it quite a bit of a difference um and there's there are other differences. so for example, it was an explicit typing and for that reason you needed to implement the typing environment and lists and so on where if you do an intrinsic typing you don't have to okay and there's also a clever way of how you deal with substitution. so the cox solution for example did it with functions rather than like lists, okay? Um, and indeed, you know, if you look at the Cox solution, which we have also publicly available, it is down to 400 and something lines, okay? And 45% of that is infrastructure. It's proof scripts, okay? But uh, you, you don't have, to, you know, that's what I meant when I mentioned experience, okay? Experience really matters. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask another question from Slido, kind of related, also comparing between your work and other approaches. So what are the pros and cons of higher order abstract syntax approach to representing binding when compared to approaches based on nominal sets? Right. So, I mean, the nominal sets approach uh, take a kind of the complete opposite view. <laughs> so I take a very local view. I like to shop locally. So uh, the context is local. Okay. Everything is local. Okay. Uh, in a, so the, the main difference is in a nominal world, you, you, you think of your, the variable you, you encounter if you go under a binder, it's global. Okay. So, um, so that means, for example, if you want, so I would be very curious if somebody wants to do this uh, logical relations proofs we have in the Poplamark challenge using nominals. Okay. Because if you start talking about typing derivations, you need to do something with it. Okay. And you need to talk about context extension. So you need to keep track of what these contexts are doing. It, and that's still an overhead that will persist. But it would be really interesting to see. And certainly Isabel nominal has been used for a very similar proof, which was uh, proving essentially algorithmic, uh, that algorithmic equality for LF is, is complete, okay. which is a very similar proof as the strong normalization proof we've done. Okay. Um, I think Neil has a question. So, um, this is more a, a question about the implementation level rather than the uh, than the uh, sort of the semantics of contextual types. But uh, you know, when when I'm implementing a compiler, one thing I've noticed is that uh, De Brown is actually bad for compilers because whenever you apply one of these weakening maps, you have to like traverse the whole term to do apply the shift. And the advantage of names is that those sort of the weakening map is always a canonical one, so you never have to apply it. Like you could just reuse the same term. Um, so in Beluga, like what led you to choose De Brown indices? Well, um, basically because I came from uh, the LF implementation, so 12 was the system I used to work with before. And um, when we started, we, we, we took a lot of the, the code base and we moved it from ML to OCaml. And it gave a very, um, it gave a very conceptual view on this. Um, I mean, I think I also should mention that Lambda Prolog uses a variation of explicit substitution calculi. So um, we're not certainly unusual, it's not, certainly not unusual um, and it's, it, I think also I'm not sure if I know how to do things in a higher order setting with names. Okay. Higher order setting plus dependent types of names. Um, so, um, so that was the, the path we took. Okay. And uh, I think it was in some way a good path. I mean, it's uh, from a performance point of view, it's, you know, it's very well. Um, but um, I know Agda has been uh, sticking to a more uh, name-based approach for, for a while. Um, but I, I mean, I would say for, for an implementation of that form for a type checker for a dependently typed system, I still think the burn is, is, is the one I would choose personally. Okay, we have a question from Slido, not about different uh, representations, but about different forms of proofs that you might do. Mm. So can you comment on mechanizing soundness proofs of program analyses? In part, I'm referring to Durai and Van Horn's constructive Galois connections from ICFP 2016. Yeah, I think that these kinds of proofs would be much simpler if we ha if we ha go move to a full type theory. Okay, uh, so uh, I think most of the time we th that's I think one another motivation, right, to move to a type theory where you have the full power of of 
of uh, functions you can define and can embed again in, in, uh, in when you define types and you have a hierarchy of universes and so on. Because uh, I think the where, where LF, often you want the combination of both, uh, but I think where, where the LF approach really shines is you, if you want to prove properties, syntactic properties, right? Logical relations, by simulation, contextual equivalence, type preservation in progress, all these kinds of properties. Uh, so, uh, so one of the big challenge in program verification is to do these large scale proof checking. Proof objects are getting huge, and it takes days to, you know, even to check the validity. So I thought the uh, your approach has a uh, a very nice foundation of fear that is a. Uh, um, you can actually write a very simple proof checker because the underlying term is really simple. So I'm curious, what's your take? On, like, what is the minimum uh, proof checker for these kind of uh, LF terms uh, you have ever written? And uh, um, and of course, you can build extra layers on top to uh, make the proof checker uh, smarter and so on, but they can all fall back to this foundation uh, checker. So you mean so, like a, a proof checker within Beluga, you mean? Yes, within Beluga. Is it, is it, you know, given this approach, you have a, you know, the, all the term and the proof and the lemmas, derivation all represented in the, what is the, do you have a very, very small proof checker? And, uh, um, and, and what's your take on, you know, how, I mean, do how you, this you mean, be? do I have a small proof checker for the programs I've written in Beluga? In, or do you mean, like, if I can write an actual proof checker in Beluga? Uh, just as a checker for the uh, LF-level objects, right? Yeah. I mean, so we, we wrote it in OCaml. And um, we have a, we, so there's, a, we do type reconstruction and elaboration, and then we have a, a small proof checker. It's, I mean, it's bigger than uh, than LF's proof checker because we have also the layer of functions, but it's it's not more than uh, 800 uh, 800 lines of code. Yeah. I mean, it actually has a very small trusted code base, okay? Because uh, in the proof checker, you don't need to refer to unification anymore. Okay, so it's really purely type checking you need to rely on and it's fully explicit. So we do have dependent pattern matching, but we keep track of, of, the, uh, of the instantiation in each of the branches. Um, I think one th aspect that would make it even smaller, and that is one, one aspect we are working on, is compiling um, the, the ma pattern matches into a core calculus, which has basically recurses and iterators. And that, that would sort of com really complete the full story because then you have really a, a, a minimum core calculus. It's also very easy to trust from a meta theory point of view as it is right now in Beluga because the proof theory required to understand why Beluga is consistent is essentially equivalent to Gödel system T. Now, of course, we give up some power, okay? So once we move to a full dependent type theory, it's not Gödel system T anymore, okay? The, the, so. So there, there, this is, there's, there's this spectrum, right, of what you want. I think if one wants to have a small trusted kernel, then you know, you, one might want to stay within like very ML or Beluga, which is sort of a similar approach. Um, if one wants to do like, you know, mechanization of many, many different properties and expand on where you can go with a system like Acta and Cock, then you're, you're sacrificing a little bit maybe on the, on the trusted code uh, core, right? And you're, you're willing to live with it but you, you gain a lot more power. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one last question from Slido. Um, so what about Dale Miller's world of Lambda Prolog and Abella? Are, there, are they easy to bridge with Beluga's contextual types? So, uh, yeah, so I mean, a lot of the, uh, the, the layer where we write programs with, which is the top layer, is, is very related to how, uh, in proof theory, you do, uh, express inductive and co-inductive proofs. And that is indeed what, what happens in, in Abella. Um, so um, the addition in Abella is that they have a Nabla quantifier, so it introduces sort of a, a global namespace. And there's another big difference in the sense that here you directly manipulate syntax trees with binders, okay? This is what you get. We give you a syntax tree with binder. 
Now, uh, the approach taken in Abella was, uh, since in the mid-90s we didn't really know how to reason about syntax trees with binders, the approach was to um, implement Church's simple type theory as an inductive type as part of the logic. Okay. And then you reason only above the water with a sort of an encoding of what was below the water. Okay. So you're not, if you're, if you're a programmer, it basically is sort of, you're not manipulating directly syntax trees. You're manipulating their encodings. Okay. Um, and so um, from my perspective, I think it's a very interesting uh, perspective because uh, they, uh, they focus on the proof theory and so it opens a lot of things about proof search. But they don't have proof witnesses, so they don't relate to programs. Okay. And so since I'd like to write programs as well as proofs, I'm, you know, I'll stick with what, what we have. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's thank Brigitte once again for a wonderful talk. <laughs>